The first plug-in hybrid version of Toyota's RAV4 draws on more than 20 years of the brand's leadership in hybrid powertrain technology to offer customers a D-segment SUV that promises to be not only more powerful than any other in its class, but also more efficient in terms of emissions and fuel consumption. There's quite a high price to pay for this technology, but the stats look tempting. A total output of 302 brake horsepower, an all-electric driving range of 46 miles and a CO2 reading of 22 grams per kilometre. The RAV4 is Toyota's most significant global SUV and it has been for over a quarter of a century. Important then that this fifth generation version showcases the brand's latest plug-in tech. Might it not create in this model something close to the ultimate family car? That's a question we're going to explore in this film, a question that Toyota itself wasn't convinced about until it decided to launch this PHEV variant in early 2021. That, to give you some perspective, is nine years after the brand pioneered this kind of technology with the Prius plug-in and two years after this fifth generation RAV4 was launched with company executives doubting that a PHEV variant was really needed. Well, it is now. Since this XA50 series model's original introduction, virtually every one of this Mark V RAV4's key rivals have been made available with a PHEV system. So, Toyota set to work to recreate this car in plug-in form, and the result has given us a two-ton SUV with more power than a base Porsche Boxster, but one with a claim to greater greenness than most of its rivals, thanks to its unbeaten 45-mile all-electric driving range capability. We've already tried this unusual confection with a different badge. The Suzuki Across is the same car with different packaging. Just another of the many segment rivals that this RAV4 plug-in has to take on in the PHEV part of the mid-sized SUV segment. So why should you choose this car? Well, time to subject it to the car and driving test treatment, which will, as usual, deliver the most comprehensive and detailed verdict on this model that you'll find. So at last, a plug-in Toyota SUV. What exactly should we expect? Well, as you'd hope, there's silence from start off as you press the hybrid power button and cruise away with a burst of electrified energy. Quite a burst, as it turns out. Uh, 62 from rest is dispatched in hot hatch style, just six seconds, which reminds you of the prodigious output that this plug-in RAV4 has at its disposal. You get 302 braked horses beneath your right foot. In the Toyota lineup, only the top version of the Supra sports car has more. As with the ordinary self-charging RAV4 hybrid, uh, which in four-wheel drive form can manage only 222 bhp, the powertrain here features a four-cylinder, 2.5-litre petrol engine mated to an eCVT belt-driven auto gearbox. But with the plug-in setup, the output of both the combustion unit and the front electric motor that that's mated to, uh, they're both boosted to around 180 brake horsepower. That's to compensate for the extra weight of the necessarily much larger 18.1 kilowatt hour battery that this PHEV model needs for its impressively long 46 mile all electric driving range. Unlike with an ordinary RAV4, all-wheel drive is mandatory with this powertrain, so there's a second electric motor driving the rear axle and producing a further 54 brake horsepower. Hence the surprisingly potent total output we mentioned earlier, although that's only enough to propel this car to a top speed of 112 miles an hour. It's limited, presumably, in deference to the current environmental zeitgeist. Uh, the performance readings that we've quoted, of course, uh, come with the assistance of combustion power. If you stay in all-electric drive, uh, the 0 to 62 miles an hour sprint figure is 10 seconds on the way to 84 miles an hour. Yes, you can choose your preferred method of power delivery. Well, you can after start-off anyway. The car always pulls away in battery-only EV mode, one of the four different powertrain operational settings that are available. 
Pressing this button near the gear stick lets you flip between EV full electric drive and the alternative HV mode, the latter being more realistic for normal driving because it runs this Toyota as a regular full hybrid, the software seamlessly blending in either petrol or electric power sources as required. A full press on the same button that connects you to a further charge mode. Now that sees the engine note rise as it uh, rather inefficiently actually charges the battery while you're driving. All that might sound quite complicated but driving the RAV4 plug-in really isn't. You don't have to make driving choices unless you really want to uh, and that's because an additional Auto EV HV mode button is also provided and that essentially makes all the decisions for you. Its choices seem effective too because the advertised 46 mile electric driving range figure turns out to be not beyond the bounds of achievability, which has been a bit of a revelation to us, having spent the last few years testing PHEVs which regularly undershoot their advertised EV range by 35% or more. Bottom line, the technology works from an efficiency point of view anyway. Where most Toyota Motor Corporation derived hybrid products tend to struggle though is in the way that they respond under throttle load. The problem lies in the belt driven CVT auto transmission this setup must necessarily be mated to with its arbitrarily placed virtual gear ratios. Uh, even when you're accelerating quite gently the gearbox sends the rev soaring without much accompaniment in terms of rapid forward motion. Uh, push your right foot down harder and much the same thing happens although with the added bonus of a straining engine note. Initially this is very frustrating until you realise that a different driving style is required here. You don't make a hybrid engine go quickly by ramming your right foot to the floor uh, but by backing off the throttle between ratios in a way that lets the revs drop and lets the engine bite into its torque curve. Once you understand this, uh, things improve and they get better still once you realise that the initially rather dead feel that you get when you're pushing on the accelerator can be mitigated by playing with the three mode driving dial that you'll find near the drive system setting buttons that we just mentioned. Uh, eco, normal and sport mode options, they're offered uh, and they tweak uh, steering and throttle feel along with gear change response. Uh, with the sport mode activated, the 2.5 litre VVTi engine gathers itself together with a bit more enthusiasm and the speedometer, which displays with green or white themes in other modes, uh, switches itself instead into a red tinged glow. You can't raise your hopes too high of course in this regard, as usual with full hybrids, mid-range torque is pretty terrible, overtakes have to be planned with care because the 227Nm figure is about 40% less than the kind of pulling power you'd get from a comparable 2 litre diesel and the 1500 kilo brake towing capacity figure is a ton less and you'll feel the extra weight of all those PHEV mechanicals in terms of body roll if you start to push on a bit too hard through tighter bends uh, which you're not likely to want to do actually because the electric power steering doesn't offer much in terms of driver feedback. But hey, let's look at what this car can give you. The incredible ability to virtually ignore petrol stations for all but the longest journeys. I mean, let's give it a break. In any case, there's a lot to like here once you learn to drive this car the way it was designed to be driven. The stiff GAK Toyota chassis provides for a low centre of gravity and that helps to offset some of the downsides of this model's extra weight and bolted to it is a sophisticated double wishbone rear suspension setup that delivers supple damping and that copes quite reasonably with school run speed humps but it can sometimes feel a bit over firm on nastier potholes and ruts. Uh, highway cruising speeds are as refined as you'd hope from a hybrid wind draw from the rather over large wing mirrors is the only real source of cabin disturbance and all of this is helped by the fact that uh, there's less noise from the hybrid engine because it can run at lower revs compared to a conventional RAV4 hybrid. Noise and vibration, uh, they're also suppressed by extra insulation in the wing linings and also in the front pillars and the use of acoustic glass for the windscreen and for the front side windows too. We usually finish a review of a mid to larger sized four wheel drive SUV with a quick summary of off roadability, very quick in some cases. Soft roaders of this sort aren't really intended for the Serengeti and the modest 190mm ground clearance of this one means that you'd be very unwise to venture anywhere very arduous with it. 
To be fair though, on grounds that's fairly even, the all-wheel drive I system in play here performs reasonably well, partly because when necessary, it's able to direct more torque to the rear wheels than many mechanical 4x4 systems deliver. Uh, that really helps when you're pulling away on loose, slippery surfaces, at which point the AWD I system automatically distributes torque accordingly to the tractional needs of each axle. With a front to rear split that can vary from 100% at the front and zero at the back to up to 20% front and 80% at the rear depending on conditions. Equally important is the inclusion of an automatic limited slip differential control called a trail mode and it's selected via this button between the seats. It deals with an important issue which afflicts some less capable four-wheel drive crossovers, uh, cars that run the risk of getting stranded if a driven wheel loses contact with the ground on very uneven terrain. Uh, should this happen when trail mode is activated, the free rotating wheel will be braked while drive torque is directed to the grounded wheel. At the same time, uh, throttle control and the transmission shift pattern will be adapted to help the driver keep the vehicle moving. That's all very reassuring should you end up with this Toyota somewhere that you really shouldn't have ventured in the first place. Uh, not a very wise policy because the key off-road stats are distinctly modest. The maximum approach angle is only 17.5 degrees. The maximum departure angle is 20 degrees, isn't much better. And you'll slide hairily down that kind of slope because this car doesn't get any kind of hill descent control system. None of this will be of much interest to a typical RAV4 plug-in customer who will be keen to be briefed on the fact that this Toyota gets a full complement of the brand's latest camera-driven drive and safety features. The pre-collision autonomous braking system is one of those that works at night and that is of course when the majority of accidents happen. Plus there's intelligent adaptive cruise control which offers an element of semi-autonomous drive assistance for the kind of highway environment where this car feels most at home as both engine and electrification combine for efficient progress. At which point you might be excused a smug smile of satisfaction as you cruise alongside the smoky diesel powered mid-sized SUVs that you could have bought for much the same kind of money. Plug-in hybrid tech uh, might have a limited lifespan in all our motoring futures, but right here and right now, especially in this car, it really does seem to make an awful lot of sense. Unlike full EVs, plug-in hybrid models never get bespoke design. In fact, there are rarely any exterior differences at all, apart from unique badging and an extra charging flap. You won't spot anything much different here either, although Toyota has made a few detailed changes so that folk who have stumped up for this PHEV variant's not inconsiderable price tag can feel a bit better looked after. If you don't happen to be familiar with this fifth generation XA50 series RAV4, then you'll find it lower, wider and more angular than its predecessors. Uh, the idea here is to make a bit more of a driveway statement, especially here at the front, incidentally, where corner cutouts house circular fog lamps, uh, narrow full LED headlamps flow into slim nostrils just above the polygon shaped grille, uh, which for this plug-in variant gets darker treatment for the mesh and for the frame. Uh, other changes for this PHEV include a metallic moulding for the bumper and dark silver finishing for this uh, skid plate style lower underarm panel. From the side, the main changes lie with the addition of an extra charging flap over the right-hand rear wing, and there are these bespoke wheels with their contrast, bright machined and black finish. You get 18 inches with the base variant and 19 inch rims otherwise. Uh, these ones are of the five double spoke design. Uh, otherwise, this profile perspective is the usual one that you get with any other Mark V RAV4 with Jeep style squared off wheel arches and chiseled lines particularly this prominent crease that flows upwards from the front wheel arches and above the door handles before culminating in this angled rear D-pillar. Privacy glass and black roof rails are standard and if you avoid entry level trim, you'll get a gloss black finish for the door mirror caps and the roof too. The rear is also cleanly finished, if perhaps not quite as distinctive. RAV4 Cognoscenti will recognize this plug-in model from the back by this garnishing trim strip that arches above the brand badge and links the LED tail lamps, and perhaps by the way that the rear skid plate is painted black. 
As with all RAV4s, you get this neat roof spoiler with, on most models, a shark fin style aerial just beyond. Of course, as usual, what's more important is the stuff you can't see. In this case, the stiff, sophisticated GAK platform, which improved the body rigidity of this fifth generation RAV4 by an impressive 57% and lowered its center of gravity for more dynamic handling. Okay, let's take a look inside. Uh, Toyota lowered the driver's hit point of this fifth generation model by 15 millimeters to make it easier to get into. Once inside, you realize that Toyota's designers are at last starting to grasp the importance of premium feeling cabin quality when it comes to Conquest sales. Uh, the brand does have plenty to learn still from rivals like Peugeot and Volkswagen in this regard, but it's all a big step forward from the low rent Fisher Price style plastic finishing that the company expected buyers to pay near premium money for in previous generation models. Uh, this plug-in variant's ambiance is enhanced by red stitching for the dash and for the doors. That also features on the sport seats too, which come trimmed in in leather of either the man-made or natural variety, depending on the trim level you've chosen. Other bespoke plug-in model touches are more difficult to spot and require inspection of the various driver displays available. Take, for example, the various extra selectable menus containing specific plug-in hybrid vehicle content that you'll find on this 9-inch Toyota Touch 2 central monitor. This infotainment screen, although improved with a slightly bigger size and the addition of Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring since we first tested this Mark V RAV4, still lags behind the displays you get with obvious rivals in terms of graphical sophistication and speed of response. Still, it does cover off the usual DAB audio, Bluetooth and online connectivity options. Plus, you get navigation, which can't be had on this car's close cousin, the Suzuki Across. Also on the plus side, this monitor is nicely situated directly in your sight line at the top of the dash. And we're pleased that it retains the physical knobs that quite a few rivals make you do without. So you're not always trying to stab away at the touch screen. We also like the fact that as usual with Toyota hybrids, there's a neat energy monitor that shows you at any time what's being charged or powered by what. Some of the Toyota Touch 2 functions can also be viewed on the instrument binnacle you see through this uh, three-spoke leather-stitched multifunction steering wheel here. Here again, there are a few detailed changes for this PHEV model. A battery-level display replaces the usual water temperature indicator, for example, uh, within a layout that, as on any ordinary RAV4, uses a combination of digital and analog design. That approach is somewhat limiting in terms of screen configurability. Uh, this seven inch central display isn't large enough to show anything other than a speedometer with an outer perimeter changing in color depending on the driving mode you've chosen. But it does have a useful center section that can show fuel economy, a compass, audio and trip computer readouts. As for the analog gauges that flank this display, uh, well, that battery charge indicator is joined on the right by a fuel gauge on the right too. While as usual with an electrified Toyota, there's a hybrid system indicator on the left with charge, eco and power sections. What else? Well, as we said earlier on, there's quite a smart cabin ambiance. The red stitching we alluded to before also features on the heated steering wheel. Plus there's a decent proliferation of soft touch surfaces and little touches like the leather trim for the gear selector make a big difference. You've got to like rubberized finishing though. It's everywhere from the door pulls to the ventilation dials, even the audio system volume knob. Uh, it's quite nice when you're gripping these things in cold conditions and it's rather Land Rover like. It also helps that everything seems to be well screwed together and that it's easy to find a comfortable driving position too, thanks to plenty of adjustment for the wheel and uh, there's plenty of adaptability built into these striped sports seats that are fully heated. Talking of the seats, uh, they are reasonably comfortable. That's thanks to the standard heating, eight-way powered adjustability and powered lumbar support. With this top variant, they get memory settings and cooled ventilation too. You sit reasonably commandingly and a further benefit of this fifth generation model's GAK platform lies in the way that it allows the instrument panel to be lower set, improving your view ahead. At junctions, you'll be glad of the slim front A-pillars and the relatively low belt line, the large side windows and the large well-positioned door mirrors. Your view rearwards isn't quite as good, uh, thanks to the thick D-pillars, but that needn't be an issue because rear parking sensors and the rear view camera are both standard fit. 
As the cabin practicality, well, there's plenty of it with most of the receptacles lined by shiny rubber matting. You'll most commonly be chucking small objects into this area in front of the gear stick, which includes a 12 volt port, an aux in point and a USB socket. Uh, two more USB sockets are provided in this deep lidded box between the seats, which features lift out tray. Uh, the glove box feels a bit cheap and isn't very big, but it is lockable and it has a useful narrow open shelf just above it. There are no ticket clips on the sun visors, but you do get an overhead sunglasses compartment, a ticket slot with a small cubby just above the driver's right knee, and averagely sized door bins, which incorporate bottle holders. Right, let's take a seat in the rear. When it comes to space back here, it's important to remember that you get what you don't pay for in the mid-sized SUV segment for PHEVs. Buy a slightly more affordable four-wheel drive plug-in crossover in this sector, like a hybrid four version of the Vauxhall Grandland X or the Peugeot 3008, and there really won't be very much room in the back at all, which isn't surprising. Models like those aren't that much longer than a compact Focus or Golf hatch. In contrast, if you pay the extra for a mid-sized SUV, of this Toyota size, it's 4.6 meters long, and that makes it 123 mils longer than the Vauxhall and 153 longer than the Peugeot. There's proper room for a family. Now that lower hit point that we alluded to earlier on, plus a wider opening angle for the doors, makes it easier for parents to lean in and strap down child seats and the like. And once inside, we were a bit disappointed to find that the bench doesn't slide, but the backrest does recline for greater comfort on longer journeys. And despite the lowish roof line, headroom's good too, thanks to a meter between the seat base and the roof. Uh, thanks to this Toyota's relatively lengthy 2,690 mils of wheelbase length, there's also plenty of room for legs and knees. It measures at 720 millimeters with the driver's seat set typically to give the person up front a meter of legroom. Uh, there's a bit more cabin width than you might expect too, so there's less chance of a couple of adults digging each other in the ribs. Uh, in addition, this notably low transmission tunnel here means that it's relatively easy to accommodate a third person should the need arise. What else? Well, you're looked after with heat for the two outer seating positions, rear vents and twin 2.1 amp USB ports. There are overhead reading lights and you get a fold down armrest with cup holders. There are also uh, ice fixed charge seat attachments and seat back pockets. Door cards have bins only just large enough to hold a small bottle. That's mainly because their integrated speakers are so large. There's no seven seat option in this segment, only PHEV versions of the Kia Sorento and the Hyundai Santa Fe offer that, and those are heavier, less powerful SUVs. With most plug-in hybrids of this kind though, the need to find room to store the hybrid system batteries severely compromises boot space. Is that the case here? Well, let's see. It's time to take a look in the boot. At first glance, it looks as if this tailgate glass might lift separately, and that would be a strong selling point. Unfortunately, it doesn't. Uh, you do at least get kick action functionality for this standard powered tailgate though, so it can be uh, opened with a swipe of your foot beneath the bumper, should you find yourself approaching the car laden down with bags. You will, however, be standing clutching those packages for quite a long time as this electrically powered hatch completes its arthritic perambulation upwards to eventually reveal a 520 litre capacity. That's only 60 litres less than you'll get in an ordinary RAV4. A very good figure by mid-sized PHEV crossover class standards. 125 litres more than you'll get in a Peugeot 3008 Hybrid 4. And it's also better than what you get from the premium badge models, which Toyota wants to compete with. A BMW X3 xDrive 30e offers 450 litres, while a Volvo XC60 Recharge T6 gives you 468 litres. In an ordinary RAV4, you get a useful two-level deck reversible board for the base of the cargo bay. Unfortunately, you don't get that here, but there is space beneath the floor to store the two charging leads you'll need, and the tonneau cover can fit under here when that's not in use too. Unlike with the Suzuki version of this design though, you don't unfortunately get any kind of spare wheel. There are no bag hooks, but you do get a 12 volt port here on the right, along with a 220 volt AC socket, plus there are four tie-down points. 
And thanks to the way that the backrest angle can be adjusted, positioning the rear seat more vertically can make quite a lot of difference to what uh, you'll be able to carry, uh, particularly when it comes to things like suitcases on airport runs. Uh, we are disappointed though that there's neither a ski hatch nor the option of a 40-20-40 split for the rear backrest, nor are there any cargo sidewall catches to save you having to stretch across to the seat's shoulders when it's time to fold everything flat. And when the rear seats are folded, well, there's no fold flat front passenger seat option to allow for the carriage of really long items. So you'll have to be satisfied with the very unremarkable 1168 litres of total capacity up to the level of the tonneau cover. It's 1604 if you load to the roof. Uh, the area provided here isn't quite flat, but the designers claim that this car can accommodate a 29 inch mountain bike without any wheels having to be removed. You'll be expecting to pay more to have plug-in tech with your RAV4. Well, you'll need to be ready to pay quite a lot more. At the time of this test, in summer 2021, Toyota was asking around £46,500 for the most affordable design version of this PHEV variant. To give you some perspective, that's around £11,500 more than you need for a comparably specified all-wheel drive version of the non-plug-in RAV4, which might make sticking with the conventional self-charging hybrid engine this Toyota is known for a great deal more attractive. If you are still interested in this plug-in derivative, you'll need to know that Toyota also offers it with two plusher trim grades, the mid-range dynamic spec we have here, for which at the time of this test, around £47,500 was needed, and the top dynamic premium version, for which at the time of filming, Toyota wanted around £51,000 for. Yep, you heard that right. A RAV4 can now cost you over £50,000. Obviously, for that kind of money, there are all kinds of other options available to you in the sector for mid-sized SUVs. In making comparisons, the obvious place to start is with the car, which is almost identical in every way to this RAV4 plug-in, the Suzuki Across, which Toyota allows Suzuki to sell under license. The Across retails only in one fully equipped guise, which from launch was priced at just over £45,000. We can think of a few things that might make us think twice before choosing this design with the Suzuki branding though. Firstly, from launch, the Across was only made available with a 3.3 kilowatt onboard charger, half the size of the one fitted to this RAV4 plug-in model, which means that the Suzuki will take twice as long to charge. Secondly, for reasons we couldn't really get Suzuki to explain, you can't have an Across with navigation fitted, even as an option, and that will irritate potential owners. Thirdly, uh, Suzuki residuals won't be as strong as those applicable to this Toyota. If that's enough to make you want to look beyond the Suzuki for a potential challenger here, you'll find, at first glance anyway, that there are plenty of other options. It'll be interesting to see which model assumes market leadership in the segment here for mid-sized plug-in SUVs now that the previous sales favourite, the Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV, is no longer being imported. Lots of lazy reviews you'll read or view will cast this Toyota in an unfavorable light by pointing out that PHEV versions of cars like the Ford Cougar and the Citroen C5 Aircross can be yours for around £10,000 less, but that's hardly comparing like with light because those two cars are much less powerful and they can't be had with the expensive four-wheel drive system that features here. The same comments also apply to e-hybrid badged PHEV versions of the Volkswagen Tiguan and the Seat Taraco. A Peugeot 3008 Hybrid 4 that does feature all-wheel drive has a sticker price that gets within £3,000 of a base RAV4 plug-in, but that's a saving you may not be minded to make because the Peugeot has a boot a massive 125 litres smaller and it's more cramped on the back seat. Nearly as cramped as you'll find with another contender in this uh, same price bracket, the Jeep Compass uh, 4XE. Smaller still are two Jaguar Land Rover SUV plugins, the P300e versions of the Range Rover Evoque and the Jaguar E-Pace, both of which cost from around £46,000. At the other extreme, £45,000 to £46,000 will buy you a plug-in SUV with seven seats in the form of either Kia Sorento or Hyundai Santa Fe, but those are heavier cars with less power. 
If you're not bothered about plugging in, then you might be minded to save around £10,000 over the cost of this Toyota and consider rivals like the Honda CRV Hybrid and the Subaru Forester e-Boxer. Uh, they can only be had in full hybrid form, but obviously those cars uh, rather more naturally compete with a RAV4 in ordinary self-charging hybrid form. The rivals that Toyota actually has in mind for this PHEV RAV4 don't really include any of those we've mentioned so far. Instead, with this car and especially with a plushly trimmed variant like this one, the brand is rather ambitiously tilting at premium branded PHEV mid-size models in the segment, all of which are comparably priced. In the 48 to 52,000 pound bracket, you'll find virtually all of these, namely from least to most expensive, the BMW X3 xDrive 30e, the DS7 Crossback e Tense, the Land Rover Discovery Sport P300e, the Audi Q5 TFSi e, and the Volvo XC60 Recharge T6. We haven't mentioned the Mercedes GLC 300 DE, which also falls into this price bracket because unlike all the other cars we just mentioned, it's diesel rather than petrol powered. And that seems to rather defeat the uh, environmental push behind the whole plug-in concept. Still, if you don't care about that and you want completion in your perusals, then you might want to consider that Merc 2. Uh, to complete the segment picture here, uh, let's tell you that a Jaguar F-Pace, uh, the P400E plug-in, starts from around 56,000 pounds. Enough, let's say you've considered all the options and having done that, you've decided there's nothing quite like a RAV4 plug-in. Once you've reached that point, then news of generous levels of standard equipment really might be enough to sway you Toyota's way. So, is that what's been provided here? Let's see, and let's start with the base design spec variant. You get 18-inch alloy wheels, front fog lamps, LED tail lights and LED projector headlights with automatic activation and a levelling system. Roof rails, rear privacy glass, uh, front and rear parking sensors, rain sensing wipers, a rear spoiler and power folding heated mirrors also make the team sheet. Plus you get keyless entry, front and rear skid plates, a shark fin style roof antenna, an alarm immobiliser, a powered tailgate with a kick action sensor and an extensive package of camera safety kit which will cover off you in just a moment. What else? Well, there's a 7.5 metre charging cable with a home charging plug, which works with an integrated 6.6 kilowatt onboard fast charger, which is double the size of the one fitted to this car's identically engineered cousin, the Suzuki Across. Driving stuff includes a three mode driving dial, a trail setting for off-road work, uh, intelligent adaptive cruise control, a speed limiter and an auto high beam feature for those headlights, which uh, dips them for you at night. On the inside, there's dual zone air conditioning. Uh, there's also a three spoke leather stitched multifunction heated steering wheel. Uh, there's also heated front and rear seats with part synthetic leather trim. There's an eight way power adjustable driver's seat that also has lumbar support too. Uh, an auto dimming rear view mirror. Uh, there's a wireless phone charging pad and there's reclining rear seats too. Media connectivity comes courtesy of a 9-inch multimedia center dash Toyota Touch 2 touchscreen, which incorporates a reversing camera, uh, which will let you Bluetooth in your smartphone and provides access to a six-speaker DAB stereo system with front tweeters and also speed sensing volume control. You might though, uh, like us, be rather surprised to find that what it doesn't have is any built-in navigation. Toyota says that the uh, multimedia display set up standard Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring functionality uh, will enable owners to instead simply project navigational apps onto the uh, center dash screen from their smartphones. Well, that's all very well until you find yourself driving in an area which doesn't have any smartphone reception. Talking of uh, media connectivity though, uh, all RAV4 owners get use of Toyota's MyT smartphone app. Now in this case, that allows you to check up on your battery level. It'll also let you program recharging times and it'll uh, let you preheat or pre-cool this RAV4's cabin. 
So quite a lot's included with base design trim. It's quite likely though, you're gonna want the sharper looks of this mid-range dynamic variant, uh, which gets larger 19 inch wheels, also a contrast colored black bitone roof, uh, black door mirror caps, and a black shark fin antenna. If you want a bit more than that, then your dealer will direct you instead towards the top dynamic premium variant. Now that will also give you the real niceties. It'll give you full leather upholstery with cooled air ventilated seats at the front, uh, memory settings for the driver, and also power adjustment for the front seat passenger. Plus there's also a nine speaker JBL premium surround system, a head up display, and a Skyview panoramic glass roof. There aren't many options and most of the ones you can have are practically orientated. The Essential Protection Pack gives you a rear bumper protection plate, a boot liner and front and rear mud flaps. The Protection Plus Pack adds to that tally with rubber floor mats. You can also add in side steps and of course a retractable tow bar and you will need the optional roof crossbars if you're going to be fitting a roof box or perhaps carriers for bikes, skis, snowboards or kayaks. Uh, for the boot, there's also a dog guard and a dog guard divider. As for aesthetics, well, bear in mind that you'll almost certainly be paying your Toyota dealer more for your choice of paint color because the only standard shade is solid pure white. Otherwise, you'll need one of the various pearlescent shades. Uh, we have Scarlet Flare here, and that's a bespoke shade for this model. You might also want to add the optional chrome pack. Now that will give you uh, chrome side seals and a chromed lower boot garnish. What about safety kit? Well, there's plenty of that because all the camera and radar elements that you'd usually get in Toyota's Safety Sense package come, of course, as standard here. Most of the features work via this single lens camera and millimeter wave radar. They're both embedded here at the top of the windscreen into a unit that's been made very compact so as to give the driver a wider field of vision. Uh, let's talk you through what's on offer. Probably the key inclusion is the pre-collision system with pedestrian detection autonomous braking, which unlike some modern setups of this kind, works as well for pedestrians at night or in situations of poor light as it does in the daytime. Uh, those are after all the kinds of conditions in which most accidents take place. Now, as you drive, the pre-collision system's radar scans the road ahead in search of potential collision hazards at speeds of between zero and 112 miles an hour. Like most autonomous braking systems, this one can detect people, animals, solid objects, or other vehicles which might stray into your path. And in daylight hours between six and 50 miles an hour, it can specifically detect errant bicycles too. If an imminent risk of collision is detected, the PCS pre-collision system will alert the driver and prepare the brakes for maximum pre-collision brake assist stopping force. If the driver fails to act, then autonomous emergency braking will be triggered and that can reduce vehicle speed by up to 25 miles an hour, potentially bringing the car to a stop and avoiding an impact. But that's just one of the camera safety features included here. There are quite a few others. A lane departure alert with steering control, for example, which incorporates vehicle sway warning and lets you know if the car is wandering over road markings. If it is, gentle, subtle steering lock will be applied to ease you back to where you ought to be in your lane. Then there's RSA, road sign assist, which pictures road signs as you pass them and then displays them on the dash. And we mentioned earlier the automatic high beam setup, which dips your headlights for you at night to avoid dazzling oncoming motorists. One feature we particularly like is this car's intelligent adaptive cruise control package. We mentioned that earlier and it's able to automatically regulate your speed on the highway to maintain a safe gap to the car in front, varying it as necessary to suit speed and congestion. The intelligent bit of this system lies in the way that the windscreen camera can now recognize new speed limits on major roads and let the driver adjust his or her speed to keep within the limit simply by using switches on the steering wheel. So uh, in theory, you need never be caught out by a speed camera ever again. Uh, there is also an e-call emergency system and that will automatically alert the emergency services with your exact GPS location if the airbags go off. 
In any modern era product of this kind these days, you also expect the potential for a degree of autonomous driving support, which this Toyota provides courtesy of this car's standard LTA, Lane Trace Assist, Lane Centering function. Now, when you're traveling at speeds above 31 miles an hour, this monitors the markings on motorways and major routes and applies steering assist to keep the car centered in its lane. This can reduce collision risks and the burden on the driver when making long highway journeys. The lane centering feature is also great for slow stop and go traffic where it works in concert with the intelligent adaptive cruise control system to track the path of the vehicle in the lane ahead, uh, maintaining a safe distance and speed and bringing the car to a halt when necessary and moving this Toyota off seamlessly when the traffic flow resumes. This can relieve a RAV4 plug-in driver of of much of the stress of driving in congested traffic and it can significantly reduce the risks of common low speed rear end collisions. We also need to mention two further standard radar driven features, RCTA, rear cross traffic alert, that can detect approaching vehicles and warn you as you reverse out of a bay, while the BSM blind spot monitor works on the move to stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake when there's a vehicle in your blind spot. The RAV4 plug-in also gets plenty of more conventional safety kit too. Twin front, side and curtain airbags for example, plus a further airbag for the driver's knees and ISOFIX charge seat mounts on the two outer rear seats. On top of that there's hill start assist control to prevent the car from rolling backwards as you pull away on steep inclines, plus VSC stability control and the usual ABS braking and traction control systems too. You also get driver attention alert, which sounds a warning if drowsiness is detected, a tyre pressure warning system and trailer sway control to prevent snaking when you're towing. If you can afford the required rather plump asking figure for this uh, plug-in RAV4, uh, then all the other costings attached to this car look very attractive indeed. Uh, you will certainly come across plenty of people who will be happy to tell you that PHEVs of this kind are mostly much the same, uh, which actually isn't true at all, as you'll discover once you begin to analyse the stats of this Toyota. And they're shared, of course, with its mechanically identical Suzuki Across plug-in cousin. Uh, we have already touched on the 46 mile EV driving range that was in our driving experience section. It's comfortably class leading, uh, even really cold weather doesn't seem to reduce the range by very much. Now the best that most rivals in this class can manage, well that's around about 35 miles and some segment contenders don't even get close to that. Our much pricier long-term Volvo XC60 recharge plug-in model is only rated at 28 miles and it never gets close to that stated figure. Unlike this Toyota, which in certain circumstances might even do better, the engineers claim it could travel up to 61 miles in urban driving conditions with the EV mode activated. Just as impressive is this RAV4 plug-in model's 22 grams per kilometre CO2 reading. To give you some class perspective, a rival Range Rover Evoque P300e plug-in is twice as smoky at 44 grams per kilometre and you'll struggle to find an all-wheel drive direct PHEV rival uh, that doesn't record a CO2 reading somewhere in the mid to late 30s. That's an advantage for this Toyota, which is significant because it enables it to offer a super low benefiting kind tax liability of 6%. Uh, virtually every other key rival is rated at 10%. The officially stated combined cycle fuel reading is also difficult to better, 282.5 mpg on the combined cycle, although of course that has no relation to what you're likely to achieve in the real world think more like 50 to 60 mpg if you use this car properly, regularly charging it. If you don't, then you'll merely be driving around a two-ton petrol-powered 4x4 SUV and that won't be a very efficient form of motoring at all. At higher speeds, you'll need to bear in mind that the quoted fuel figures are even more heavily dependent than usual on the driver assuming a significant degree of restraint. Certainly, for noteworthy levels of frugality in day-to-day -day use with this Toyota, you'll need to keep the powertrain operating setting in EV mode as often as possible and frequently twist the three-mode driving dial by the gear stick into the left-hand eco mode. Uh, that moderates the throttle response and the engine power output, 
while tweaking the climate control too. Plus, you'll also need to keep a very careful eye on the hybrid system indicator, which replaces the usual rev counter on the left-hand side of the instrument binnacle, and make sure that the needle stays as often as possible in either of the blue charge or green eco zones. You can monitor the hybrid system's cleverness on the energy display that you'll find on the instrument binnacle screen and more colourfully on the centre console monitor. Uh, the centre dash display also provides graphical trip information and history screens so you can gauge your ongoing success in energy regeneration and fuel economy. The instrument binnacle screen has selectable displays and they allow you to see the uh, percentage of driving that's been conducted under full battery power and also the number of miles that you've covered in either the EV, full battery or HV hybrid powertrain settings. There's also an eco zone screen where the car will score your driving for start, cruise and stop efficiency and an EV driving ratio screen which calculates the percentage of your trip which has been conducted purely on battery energy. Also recording it in minutes and seconds uh, if you want to bore your passengers uh, with extra stats. What else? Well, all the technology in play here might make you worry about this Toyota plug-in model's reliability, but the Prius-derived engineering scores very highly in almost every customer satisfaction survey going, which is thanks to some very careful engineering. Take, for example, the way that the hybrid system operates an automatic warm-up phase to help to protect the petrol engine against excessive wear that might occur if it was called on to make regular cold starts and then run almost immediately at motor away speeds. Uh, to guard against potential issues here, power is initially slightly limited on really cold mornings and then it's progressively increased and as a driver you'll be alerted to this warm-up phase by an engine icon that shows blue in the hybrid energy flow display. We also ought, as part of this section, to point out a couple of key differences between this car and its mechanically almost identical Suzuki Across Cousin. The most important of these is that this RAV4 plug-in uses a 6.6 kilowatt onboard charger, which is twice the size of the one in the Suzuki, which is why it only takes around two and a half hours to recharge this Toyota from a conventional 7.4 kilowatt garage wall box, as opposed to five and a half with the Suzuki. The 18.1 kilowatt hour battery in question contains 96 cells and it has a rated voltage of 355.2 volts. It's also worth pointing out that this Toyota gives you a much better warranty than the limited three-year 60,000 mile one you'll get with a Suzuki. Uh, like all Toyotas, this model gets a three-year warranty from new, but providing you continue to regularly maintain your car at uh, one of the brand's franchised dealerships, uh, 12 months of extra warranty cover will be included with every scheduled service. That's up to 100,000 miles or 10 years, whichever comes around first. Servicing intervals are rather frequent though, every year or 10,000 miles, whichever comes first. Fixed price servicing plans are available if you want to spread the cost of maintenance and they allow you to spread the cost over two years or more. However you go about paying for maintenance on a RAV4 plug-in, it shouldn't cost you too much. After all, there's no starter motor or alternator to go wrong, uh, there are no drive belts to break, there's a maintenance-free timing chain, there's no particulate filter to get clogged up with diesel fumes, and of course, uh, thanks to the CVT automatic gearbox, there's no clutch either. The hybrid setup has a good record for minimizing tire wear, and the battery will last the life of the car. Plus, the regenerative braking setup helps to extend the life of the brake pads. Over 60,000 miles of driving, the front pads should only need replacing once, while the rear pads and all the discs will probably last the full distance. What else might you need to know? Uh, what about vehicle excise duty? Well, alternatively fueled cars, those with any sort of hybrid powertrain, are subject to a £10 annual road tax discount, unlike uh, full EVs, which are fully exempt. And at first glance, you'll be pleased to see that a RAV4 plug-in sits in the same VET tax band as an ordinary RAV4 hybrid. Uh, there is a key difference, though, because every version of this plug-in model costs over £40,000, so all variants are subject to a £335 surcharge, the first five times you tax them, uh, which takes a total to £480 a year during that time. 
Despite the extremely high price for this Toyota, uh, the predicted residual value of this RAV4 plug-in model is class competitive, 40% after three years and 60,000 miles. Insurance is quite a lot cheaper than on the Across, rated at either Group 34 or 35, depending on trim. To give you some perspective on that, the ordinary RAV4 hybrid sits in Group 30. A premium badged rival like the Volvo XC60 Recharge T6 sits in Group 41. We don't really understand why plug-in tech wasn't included with the fifth generation RAV4 range from the outset. It is, after all, crucially important for a car in this class to offer that option these days. Although, as a buyer of this Toyota SUV, we'd recommend that you think long and hard over whether you actually really need it. A conventional RAV4 self-charging hybrid is commendably efficient, it's very eco-minded, and it's far cheaper. It's unlikely indeed that in ownership running cost savings, a private buyer would ever make back the premium necessary to choose this PHEV. For a business user, of course, it might be different. Such are the benefiting kind taxation advantages of opting for a PHEV model these days. Plus, there's the not inconsiderable advantage of being able to conduct the vast majority of your commuting mileage on an almost fuel-free basis. The typical European buyer's average daily trip to and from work being around 31 miles. In a couple of decades, the plug-in hybrid phase will have passed us by, but right here and right now, its advantages are considerable. There you have it then. If the sums add up, this Toyota's blend of virtues hits the spot for you and you're offered the right deal, you might well find much to like with a RAV4 plug-in. The only car in the segment that can match it for CO2 cleanliness and economy is its identically engineered Suzuki Across Cousin. And the same goes for EV driving range, which is not only class leading, but actually achievable. On the debit side, apart from the high price, of course, there's a slightly over firm feel to the ride and the fact that you can't have seven seats, but that's about it. In summary, the RAV4 plug-in may not be the ultimate family car, but it gets close enough to justifying that title to satisfy quite a few who'll be searching for a state-of-the-art plug-in SUV of this size. Plug-in hybrids really are getting better, even if they're not getting any cheaper. And if you can afford it, then you'll find that this is one of the very best of them.